So this evening, we come to look at the first book of the Psalms, Psalms 1 through 41. And over the next three Sunday evenings, we'll manage to make it through book 1, verse, uh, chapters 1 through 41, book 2, uh, chapters 42 through 72, and book 3, uh, chapters 37 through 89. And I guess at the beginning of this, before we really dive into the text here, it's the question of why. Why are we doing this this evening? Is it simply that I've run out of ideas and I needed something to preach this evening? That may be part of it. But I do think that when we come to the book of Psalms, uh, like most of the books of the Bible, we, there's very much great profit for each and every psalm. You can take any psalm in the Psalter and you will find something to nourish your soul in. But it does appear that the book of Psalms does have a, a flow or an organization to them. And I think that organization or that flow of the psalms helps us and ultimately see better the Lord Jesus Christ. For it's not that every single psalm you somehow need to find a way to, to squash Jesus into that psalm, but From Psalm 1 to Psalm 150, they all cry out and are telling and narrating this wonderful and great and glorious story of Jesus. That's really the thesis, if you will, that I'm operating on. And that's the reason why I want to take these in, in much larger chunks this evening. For the book of Psalms is, in one sense, it is organized at least in some way because there are five books. Somebody at some time put these books or put these psalms together, and at the end of each book, there's included a doxology. So someone thought that this order made sense, and that somehow it would guide the people of the Lord in their worship. And so as we we look at that, as we look to that this evening, it might be helpful to just get a simple roadmap of really where we're going through the psalms. Uh, This evening, we'll look at the first book of Psalms, which primarily, if you read it, uh, it's all about confrontation. In one way or another, we usually see the the Messianic king facing off against enemies. And I challenge you, if you want to to try to to see if this point is true, read the Psalms 1 through 48 uh, this week. The second set of Psalms 42 through 72, where where book one seems to be focused on David and his rise to the throne, book two seems to have more of David on the throne and dealing with the nations surrounding. And the nations become much bigger players in book two. And so book three then comes, 73 through 89, and you really have the turning point. Psalm 72 which I preached on earlier, is this wonderful psalm of expectation of the great son of David. And we know the history of Israel where the kingdoms split and then collapse. And Psalm 73 through 89, which is the shortest book in the Psalter, is all about this devastation. And Psalm 88 and 89 are very uh, famous, if you will, for laments that don't really have a turning point. They sort of end with the devastation of everything around them, sitting like Job, wondering what has happened. But book three ends with a doxology as well. Book four, 90 through 106, there's this contemplation. Now that the earthly king has fallen, what does Israel fall back on? Well, 90 through 106, the dominant theme is that God is their king, and you'll see that throughout. And book 5, 107 through 150 is consummation. There's this resurgence of Psalms of David. And there's this resurgence of hope in a coming king. Indeed, Psalm 110, the very famous psalm about a coming king who's also a great priest. And it seems as if this is is ridden out through the rest of book 5 to the point that when you get to the very end, the last five psalms, are this ever-increasing cycle of praise. And so the last, uh, so Psalm, I'm not going to do math up here. This will go not well for me. But the, the last five begin and end with hallelujah. But then Psalm 150, the last psalm in the Bible, every single line is hallelujah. So it seems someone has organized and, and, and really shown us this, this pathway to glory through the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And you'll notice inside the Psalms, there are little or smaller collections like the Psalms of Ascents that we've looked at previously or the Hallel Psalms. So again, I think there is organization here. And I think ultimately, as Jesus told the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus, that all of this is about Him. And so enough with the introduction of the Psalter. As we come this evening looking at Psalms 1 through 41, we'll kind of move over Psalms 1 and 2. I think we've talked about those a lot as we've preached on those, that these are the the doorways into the Psalter. They have this dual blessing to them. There's the blessing of the way of righteousness, and there's the blessing in the Son, the King. And so these two Psalms will frame the rest of the Psalter and, and the path to righteousness and the path to the King. And so as you'll see in your service sheets there, I've included a few psalms, a few select verses here, but we'll continue through this. Psalm 3, as we uh, sang earlier, it plunges us immediately into conflict. If you think of starting the the book of Psalms, where would you start? Here, it, it seems to start in the middle of the action, if you will. If you've ever read a book or seen a movie where it immediately throws you into the action and then later has to explain what has just happened here. Psalm 3 throws us in the midst of conflict. Note the way it begins. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. David here seems to be pictured the Messiah is surrounded by enemies on every side. In Psalm 4, he continues, answer me when I call. You have given me relief in the past, but be gracious to me here and now. Now he's, he's speaking of how long will his honor be turned into shame. He has those speaking lies against him. And it continues in Psalm 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry. Psalm 6. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. And again, these themes will be found throughout book one of David crying out because there are enemies around him. There is conflict around him. And it continues uh, as we go through the first part. And then we we sort of stop. And and there's this breath of fresh air with Psalm 8, this little oasis, if you will, in the the midst of all of this conflict. It it seems as if David is in the midst of conflict on on the left hand and on the right hand, and Psalm 8 seems to have this wonderful episode in his life where he is is secure for the moment. If any of you have ever been camping, it's that scene of, of at night when you look out among the stars and everything is peaceful and you hear the sounds of nature around you. David here looking up into the sky contemplating his existence, wondering who he is in the great grand scheme of things. And then in verses nine, chapters 9 through 17, we're thrown right back in to conflict, where David will cry out for refuge in Psalm 11. He'll cry out for deliverance in Psalm 12, and he'll cry about enemies and foes in Psalm 13. And it seems as if he pauses for a moment in chapters 14 and 15, and there's this talk of wise and foolish living, this theme that keeps being put throughout the Psalms. For the Psalms are not just talking about the the wickedness out there and the, the evil out there, but they're to be used in the worship of God's people to guide us on a path to righteousness. And in many of these Psalms, they'll paint for us the picture of evil. And really to describe to us ways in which we should not go. And then we come in chapters 16 and 17 back to this theme of deliverance. Again, it will just come back and back and back. And then wonderfully, again, we we come to Psalm 18, probably one of my favorite psalms. It's this epic, long psalm. But you'll note David has been praying and praying and praying that the Lord would deliver him. In many of the Psalms, David finds rest and respite, but it doesn't seem he gets an immediate answer to his prayers. And then Psalm 18, he prays, I call upon the Lord. And then these wonderful words in verses 6 and 7, from his temple, he hears my voice. And that alone would bring comfort to know that God is listening, that his cry has reached him. But then the rest of the 
the rest of this, of, of this psalm then goes into the earth. It reels and rocks. The foundations tremble. The earth quakes because the Lord is angry. And He swoops down, as it will, out of heaven in order to rescue and save His anointed King. He is this great conquering and victorious God who comes to the aid of His people. And through the rest of Psalm 18, it shows how He empowers David to then go on and to conquer. In Psalm 19, Psalm 18 and Psalm 19 really work as this, this hinge where things start to change throughout the rest of the first book of the Psalms, teaching sin and God as the stable one, as the the rock upon which he can find his hope in. These are themes that then now start reoccurring that really haven't occurred in these first sections. So again, coming back to the organization that really Psalms 3 through 17 are just distress and crying out. Psalm 18 is God's response. And then Psalm 19 is this reflection upon creation and upon God's law. And from there, we move into these great psalms, ones that we'll probably know the most out of the Psalter, Psalm 22 and Psalm 23. But Psalms 20 through 24, they form this, these psalms about kingship. And so you have in Psalm 20, the Lord saving His anointed king. In 21, the earthly king trusts in the great king. And Psalm 22, the psalm that we we certainly know from the lips of Jesus, his cry of dereliction. But the psalm also continues in chapter, in verse 28, for kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. So even in that cry of dereliction, that crying out to the Lord as David has been doing, as Jesus does, is still a recognition that the Lord is the sovereign king over the universe. And Psalm 23, the most well-known psalm, but what is it? It is the great shepherd king shepherding his people. Psalm 24, another psalm that's probably one of my favorites, is God coming as this victorious king. And so we have these psalms that seem to intermingle between the Messiah as king and God as king. And really leading us through the path of the Psalms to the point at which the earthly king and the heavenly king become the same in the Lord Jesus Christ, great David's greater son. And then after meditating upon God as king, we're thrown back again into more conflict. In 25 through 33, we have this conflict. In 25, he begins, I'm lonely and afflicted. In 26, he cries out that you would vindicate me. In 27, he starts speaking of the Lord as a great stronghold. And you think of using and calling the Lord as a a stronghold. It's It's a fortress. And that type of language used, if you've ever seen a military fortress, it's used as a place that you can run into and feel protected. I remember early on visiting a friend of ours in the city of Toledo, Spain. And it's got this wonderful old uh, city where it used to be a fortress. It's built upon a hill and you have the city up top with these giant walls and you realize why this was the capital of Spain during the medieval period. Because nobody could take this fortress even if they tried. And here, David speaking of the Lord as a great stronghold, as a fortress, as a continual reminder of, yes, the conflict that he's in, but also the strength and power of the Lord that in Psalm 29, which we sang about, we sang about the power of the Lord, but you'll notice the, the words of these songs are not just that God is, is powerful in the abstract, But he's powerful specifically as as his voice goes forth. It's shattering trees. It's like a a hurricane as it makes landfall. Just the mere sound of him speaking shreds trees. Hills seem to move out of his way. The desert seems to undulate and move. I was little when I went through an earthquake in California. And this idea here of the the desert moving, the desert of Kadesh to shake, it is still a vivid memory that I have 
of the ground shaking and undulating at the power of the earth as it shook. And here it is not just a, an earthquake that has happened because of tectonic plates, but rather because the Lord has spoken. In Psalm 31, David cries out, would you deliver me? And the, leading us into the end of book one, it's interesting that as we, we look at many of these psalms about conflict, but they're also about trust. That David, in the midst of all of these circumstances, whether slander or just outright threats on his life, that throughout it all, he constantly comes back to this wonderful theme that God is his God, that he is his stronghold, that the Lord is mighty in battle, that the Lord's voice shakes the world. And the, book of, the first book of Psalms then ends contemplating really the, the, the suffering that believers go through. I think it's just, again, interesting if, if you're organizing the book, the, the first part of it really speaks about the, the external conflict that the believers feel in this world, that there is a, a kingdom of Satan and a kingdom of God, that there is unrighteousness and righteousness, and that these two do not exist harmoniously together. But as God said in the garden, I will put enmity between you. And Psalm 3 is that enmity writ large. The ending of the book of Psalms, it comes in, in terms of suffering as they cry out for the Lord to deliver. In, verse, in chapters 34 through 37, you have these uh, innocent sufferers. You have someone crying out to the Lord because he is suffering at the hands of evildoers. And these psalms are a, a balm to anyone who has ever experienced this type of evil against them. In Psalm 34, the righteous cry for help, the Lord delivers. In Psalm 35, he prays, without cause, I'm innocent. Evildoers come against me. In 36 and 37, it's to shun evil and pursue righteousness. Psalm 37 speaks of the righteous inheriting the land. And so this conflict is external, but here they are, are suffering in the midst and crying out to the Lord. A theme that I think we can see throughout the Psalms and probably one of the greatest uh, gifts that are the Psalms are just the Holy Spirit giving us those words that we can cry out to the Lord in the midst of those times. And it also comes back to the, the totality of the Psalms that the Holy Spirit has given us these words to pray, to know that throughout the Psalms and throughout Scripture, we do not weary God by coming to Him when we are suffering. But in fact, He's given us 150 songs and prayers to model and to use. But then book one ends in 38 through 41. Again, in a, a way I, which I would not... If I were organizing it, end this way, but it ends with four psalms speaking about the guilty suffering. Really, you take con conflict externally and you, you bring it internally. Now the, the person who is praying is suffering because of his sins. Psalm 38, rebuke me not in your anger. In verse 18, I confess my sins. In Psalm 39, verse 8, deliver me from all my transgressions. In Psalm 40, verse 12, my iniquity has overtaken me. In chapter, or sorry, Psalm 41, verse 4, heal me, for I have sinned against you, Lord. And so four psalms culminating the end of the book here, speaking about the sin that has caused separation with the Lord, this conflict now, not just with man and man, but with man and God. And here the psalmist, here David, who his life is marked by righteousness, but also great sin. And here he finds deliverance. Again, we're, we're instructed, we're told that though your sins are many, his mercy is more. Heal me, for I have sinned. That book one ends with the, the king trying to ascend to his throne, but this king is not the perfect king. But like all of us, he sins and is, need, and is in need of an ultimate savior. 
Well, that's the super quick tour through the first book of the Psalms. And I guess the question maybe you're asking, if you're trying to remember all of those verses, is so what? (laughs) What was that all about, that whirlwind tour of the Psalms? Well, I think when you take it like this, when you look at it in a larger picture, at like 3,000 mile view, when you look down upon the Psalms and you see how many of them relate here to conflict, I think you start to see that maybe this is a theme that the Lord not only thinks is important, but He knows is important. I mean, when you think about your life, And when you think about this world, I mean, do you have times where you are buffeted by evil? Are there times when you read the news and you're grieved by the evil in this world? When you look at the state of this nation or the United States and our great Christian heritage in the state that we're in now, or do you circumspectly look inside and you see the evil in your own heart the conflict waging inside your own body. And you realize then evil is real. Spiritual forces are real. This evil is something we see every day. Then how do we, how do we respond to it? Well, God has said Psalm 3 through Psalm 41 in some capacity, in some way, can meet that need to help you to do the one thing that David has consistently done throughout the book of Psalms, and that's pray. If you think about all of these verses that I've read, right, rebuke me not in your anger, the righteous cry for help, vindicate me. I'm lonely and afflicted, deliver me, and so on and so forth. What do they have in common? It's David crying out to the one who can actually help. And if you think about it, conflict is not something we should run away from, but rather run to the Lord during those times. And it really makes it even more important how important the Psalms are. And how thankful we are to have these. Because you think about the battles yet to come. Paul speaks about all of these spiritual weapons, spiritual armor that we're to take up. The Psalms are certainly part of that. Well, as we dwell on that, thinking more deeply about this evil inside of us, We see in the last four psalms this idea to pray for forgiveness. And I think this does come back to when Jesus speaks about the the entirety of Scripture. He says this in Luke 24, verse 46. He says, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day and rise from the dead. That the Scriptures foresaw that this would happen. Well, this is an event that that indeed happened, but the theological, if you will, significance of this is in verse 47. Jesus says, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. So he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And what did Jesus say the scriptures were about? He said they were about him and they were about forgiveness of sins. That he summed up the entirety from Genesis to Revelation by saying it is about me and about my mission. And so we see that in the Psalms as the guilty come to the Lord to find forgiveness. They come to someone whom they can actually receive real forgiveness from. And finally, I think ultimately when we see this evil around us and we pray to the Lord for deliverance from it, We're also praying, as David said, break the teeth of the wicked. Lord, would you come and conquer and defeat? 
That book, one of the Psalms, has this conflict to drive us and to see we want a king who can come and conquer. We want a king who will be victorious. And I think the end of the book of Psalms leaves us with that, with these great psalms of praise. That though David was tempted, often he failed. Jesus, when tempted, conquered. I think this is interesting. When Satan quotes to Jesus from Psalm 91, Satan selectively quotes. He says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. This is verse 11 and verse 12. And here he challenges Jesus to jump and to put God to the test. But it's fascinating that he doesn't quote verse 13, which says, You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. The very next verse alludes to and uses languages that speak to Satan's own doom at the hand of Jesus. And so Jesus is the one who comes to do the Father's will, to come to conquer. Unlike David or Israel or Abraham or Adam, you know, the Psalms leave us here in book one, anticipating the greater joy of Jesus when he returns that he has come to conquer. And you think of, I would almost love to hear what David's psalms would have sounded like had he known about the Lord Jesus Christ and the way he trusts when he just doesn't fully understand things in a capacity which we have so much greater knowledge of. And yet, it's David in the midst of these threats on his life that he can lie down and sleep because he knows the Lord and his goodness. So, brothers and sisters, I commend to you the Psalms for your life and for your living, that Jesus, we pray to the one who has conquered and is conquering still. So let us pray.